Hey, welcome back. Today I'm going to be looking at a Shakespeare play called Two Noble Kinsmen. It is one of Shakespeare's last plays, and it was co-authored with John Fletcher. Now, sometimes we talk about whether a book or a movie was better, which is somewhat relevant to this play, because this was the dramatized version of a very famous piece of poetry by Geoffrey Chaucer, the first tale of the Canterbury Tales, The Knight's Tale. In Shakespeare's day, this tale was very famous and well-known, so people going to the theatre to watch Two Noble Kinsmen already knew the story. They'd probably already read it. And Shakespeare and Fletcher's version is very faithful to the original. There are some changes and some differences, but overall it captures all the key aspects of the story and generally keeps the characters the same. The biggest differences between the original poem and the play are a subplot that is developed and mostly written by Fletcher of the jailer's daughter who is in love with one of the main characters. It's interesting because it gives something of a distinction to the characters who otherwise are so similar other characters can't even see them apart. At one point the two characters Palamon and Arcate even recognize that they see each other in themselves. And Amelia, the key love interest, can't choose between the two of them because they both seem perfectly equal in her eyes. With the subplot of the Jailer's Daughter, we get some distinction and differentiation. The second thing that's often commented upon about this particular play is the fact that there was some question about authorship. Now, its first publication had Shakespeare's name on it, as well as Fletcher's. But Shakespeare became so popular that it became kind of common shortly after he died to start slapping his name on plays in order to sell them. It also wasn't included in the first folio, which some of Shakespeare's friends and peers put together of all of his works. However, that's clearly not the only mistake that the first folio made, and it is generally accepted that Shakespeare wrote a significant part of Two Noble Kinsmen. The other big differences between this play and its source material are that the play contracts time. The original story lasts over seven years, whereas this one keeps the time moving along. Rather than have Arcate go back to Thebes for years and then come back and stay in disguise for years, we go ahead and shift within 24 hours to the scene where they meet up in the woods. We also have significantly more dialogue in the play than in the poem. The poem sometimes summarizes conversations rather than hashing them all the way out. And so in the play, Shakespeare has the opportunity to further develop some of the themes that already exist in the original. And he takes that time to really emphasize different types of love. What does it mean to fall in love with a woman? What does it mean to love your best friend? What does it mean to love your family? All of those loves can be very strong but have different qualities. We see the love of family and friendship in Arcate and Palamon. We see subtly, but as a backdrop, commented upon the love between Theseus and Pirithus, two close friends. We see, of course, the romantic love that both Arcate and Palamon feel for Amelia. We have the past affection between Amelia and Flavina, which causes her to want to remain single for her whole life. And we have the unrequited love of the jailer's daughter for Palamon. And in this book, there's clearly tension between the love between family and friends and romantic love. The central conflict deals in the fact that we have two close kinsmen who deeply love each other, but then are torn apart by their mutual love for the same girl. And that love that seems so strong and so enduring is ripped apart by jealousy and competition. The play has the opportunity to end as a comedy if only Palamon would fall for the jailer's daughter instead, but in this world that is unrealistic. He hardly acknowledges her existence, and therefore this play ends as a romance, with both love and marriage as well as tragedy and loss. Another powerful aspect of this play are the female characters, particularly Amelia and the jailer's daughter. Both of them find that their feelings, their contributions to this whole situation, are mostly powerless and ignored. Arcate and Palamon are ready to kill each other over Amelia, even though at first she doesn't know they exist. And once she discovers them, mostly she just wants everyone to calm down. The thought of someone being killed for her sake absolutely horrifies Amelia. And although she doesn't want to marry anyone, she ultimately agrees to marriage just to calm everyone down and try to find a resolution that doesn't end in these guys' death. Her desire for a peaceful resolution is fairly tragic, ultimately culminating 
in her prayer before Diana's altar. Diana, of course, is the goddess of chastity, and Amelia, who hoped never to marry, seeks a resolution that will inflict the least amount of harm on everyone. The two kinsmen, however, are perfectly willing to kill each other, even though they clearly still also deeply love each other, whenever they can clear the haze of jealousy, even when Amelia doesn't recognize their existence. It's purely the thought of marrying her that riles them up enough to kill each other. Okay, let's look at the plot. After a prologue that introduces the play and acknowledges that this is the knight's tale from Chaucer, we are just dramatizing it for you, we start in Act 1 with the wedding of Theseus and Hippolyta, which is the setting also of Midsummer Night's Dream. It's worth going back and looking at that play, especially as I have never realized until I reread The Knight's Tale that Philostrate, who is a key character in Midsummer Night's Dream, is actually Archite in disguise. Go back and reread Midsummer Night's Dream with that in mind. It changes everything. Or it doesn't, I don't know. It's not that important. But it is a fun detail. The bride and groom are entering with music and song when all of a sudden these three noble queens come and kneel before them to plead with Theseus for justice. And so we cut to another very famous mythological story, the Seven Against Thebes. It's long, it's complicated, I'm not going to get into the whole thing. But after the death of Oedipus, his sons fought back and forth for the city of Thebes, along with several noble kings. Because they both killed each other, Creon took over, and he refused to allow the people on the battlefield to be buried because they fought against Thebes. This leads to all kinds of drama, which shows up in several places in mythology. The most notable place is probably the play Antigone. But here these queens are mourning because their husbands' bodies are lying out in the field, being eaten by wild animals. And they plead with Theseus to give them justice, go against Creon, defeat him, and allow them justice and, and the burial of their husbands. The significance of burying the dead and the dishonor that comes from leaving the dead to be eaten is fairly obvious and natural, but it is also worth comparing it to, say, the, the funeral scenes in the Iliad. Many of the significant points of drama in the poem The Iliad hinge on whether or not someone will get a burial. It's well worth going back and looking at that again. You can click on the card to look at my Iliad videos if you're interested. In any case, the queens, after convincing Hippolyta and Hippolyta's sister Amelia that they deserve justice, ultimately convince Theseus. And so he lets his bride go in to the feast, and he says, I will return after beating Creon. And he heads off into battle against Creon. In scene two, we cut to the characters Palamon and Archite, these two noble kinsmen who are great friends and very noble and honorable, and they're also citizens of Thebes. In fact, they're relatives of Creon. And they've come to the conclusion that Creon is a tyrant and that they ought to leave Thebes. But when they find that Theseus is coming against their city, they decide to go out to battle anyway, even though they disagree with their local politics because it's the honorable thing to do. In scene three, we cut back to Hippolyta and Amelia, who are talking with Pirithous, who is a close friend of Theseus. And here's where we begin to explore further these different kinds of loves, these friendship loves. Amelia confesses that she's never going to marry because her closest friend when she was younger died, and she can never imagine having a relationship closer than that one. Hippolyta and Amelia also admire the friendship between Pirithous and Theseus, but notice how Theseus is also able to have a relationship with Hippolyta. Friendship love and romantic love are complementary here, but Amelia is afraid that they're contrasting loves. This is, of course, going to be important throughout the rest, as Archite and Palamon's relationship is destroyed by their mutual romantic love for Amelia. In scene four, Theseus is victorious in battle, and he grants the queens the ability to find their husbands and bury their husbands. He also has brought before him two injured knights of Thebes. It's Archite and Palamon, whose injuries are so severe that they are unconscious. Because he admired their fighting, he decides to keep them as prisoners, and he gives them all the medical care he can. In scene five, the queens have their funeral and go their separate ways. I'd like to note that this is a particularly musical Shakespeare play, which tends to be true of a lot of Shakespeare's later plays. The Kingsmen had a lot more opportunity for chamber music in their plays, which I always find interesting. 
but many of the scenes in this play have musical pieces, as well as the almost constantly singing Jailer's Daughter. Act 2 begins with the Jailer who is speaking with the Wooer, a young man who is interested in marrying his daughter. It seems that they have come to an agreement, and the daughter has already accepted his proposal. The Jailer has no real money, but the Wooer is just happy to be able to marry the Jailer's daughter. However, the Jailer has also been tending on Arcate and Palamon, and she is very impressed with their nobility. The scene shifts to Palamon and Arcate in prison, who are looking out over the garden from their prison balcony. And they speak in noble language that even though they are prisoners, and apparently will be prisoners for life, at least they have each other. And if they have each other, then who cares what else they face? Their close friendship and kinship is so sweet and wonderful that no other trials can really shake them. But while they're having this conversation and talking about their love for each other, Palamon looks out into the garden and sees Amelia walking among the flowers. He is immediately smitten with her and calls her a goddess. When Arcate comes to look, he also falls in love with her. And when he begins to express his love for her, Palamon takes severe offense. Of course, Arcate says, well, you thought she was a goddess. I think she's a woman. I want to marry her. But Palamon insists that Arcate has no right to love her because he loved her first. Of course, Amelia has never even seen either of them and has no real knowledge of them. But within a few minutes, Arcate and Palamon are both so angry at each other and jealous of each other and in competition with each other that they seem to hate each other. Just at that moment, the jailer comes and takes Arcate away, who's apparently been freed on a bond. Now, there's more explanation of this in the original poem. The play just lets it alone at that. Arcate, of course, is in exile and cannot return to the city. But Palamon is distraught, because if Arcate is free, he'll find a way to get to Amelia. And then, to make matters worse, the jailer comes and says that the window is too open and Palamon is going to be moved to a cell without a window viewing the garden. Which means that Palamon will no longer be able to look on the beautiful Amelia. Talk about adding insult to injury! In scene 3, we cut to Arcate, who is in the woods, and he is envious of Palamon, who he thinks is still able to view Amelia. How can he survive since he's been cast out of Athens and can no longer view Amelia? What am I going to do? So Arcate decides to turn around and return, even if it means his death. He runs into a bunch of country bumpkins who are going to a festival and a games where they can show off their athletic skill, and he decides to disguise himself and use the opportunity to perhaps get closer to Amelia. Meanwhile, back in the prison, the jailer's daughter has fallen completely in love with Palamon, and she sees a huge difference between Palamon and Arcate. She's fallen so in love with him that she's willing to risk her life and honor by helping him escape, hoping that somehow his love will be returned. Arcate, meanwhile, has won the games because he's quite the athlete, and he's given the position of being an attendant on Amelia. Theseus is very impressed with his nobility. And of course, this is everything he could have possibly wanted. And now he's going to attend on her during the May Day. We cut back to the jailer's daughter, who has set Palamon free and sent him off to hide in the woods. She's going to try to meet him in the middle of the night and give him food and files to remove his chains, and then she hopes to run away with him. Although she's beginning to recognize, slightly in the back of her mind, that his response to her was not exactly what she hoped. He didn't cover her with kisses when she did this for him. He nobly commented upon the danger that she and her father would be put into by his escape, but he didn't really show her any affection. We cut to Act 3, which often in Shakespeare plays becomes the kind of climax. In this moment, Arcate has gone out with Amelia and all of her household to celebrate May. While alone in the woods, he sits down and begins to talk to himself about his situation. If only Palamon could see how close he's gotten to Amelia. Palamon, who happens to be in the bush behind him, jumps out and challenges him. And the two of them are very competitive and like thump their chests and yell at each other a lot. Palamon says if he could just have if he could just have one meal and a sword and his chains removed, he would duel Arcate. And so Arcate agrees and says, I'll come back with everything that you need and we'll have a duel over Amelia. 
We cut back to the jailer's daughter, who's wandered off into the woods trying to find Palamon and remove his chains. However, he's not where she expected him to be, and as she wanders around in the woods, hoping to find him, worrying that he's been eaten by wolves, she begins to realize the direness of her situation and begins to lose hope, and her mind begins to break up. And she starts going all Ophelia here. We go back to Arcate, who is returned to Palamon with the things that he needs. He offers Palamon some food and drink, as well as a file to take off his chains. They try to have a moment of peace and not talk about Amelia, and so instead they talk about other girls that they've known. Both of them are like staring daggers at each other, waiting for the other person to slip up. Palamon finally snaps at Arcate because Arcate sighs in the middle of his conversation, and he knows it's a sigh of love for Amelia. And so Arcate's like, fine, I'm leaving you alone, eat your food, file off your chains, I'll be back, we'll fight. In scene four, we are again with the jailer's daughter who, in her despair, is beginning to hallucinate and lose her mind. And she's in despair because she knows her father is doomed because of her actions, and she thinks that Palamon is doomed because of her actions, and she herself is doomed. Poor thing. In scene five, we see a schoolmaster and a bunch of country bumpkins who are preparing to do a Morris dance for Duke Theseus, but they're missing one of their dancers. The jailer's daughter, who is completely out of her mind at this point, wanders in and joins them, and dances along with them. And although she's completely out of her mind and singing all kinds of craziness, just like Ophelia, it doesn't really matter because the rest of the performance is very wild and country anyway, and Duke Theseus, Hippolyta, and Amelia seem to appreciate it. One could compare this scene with the end of Midsummer Night's Dream. In scene six, we cut back to Arcate and Palamon. Arcate has shown back up with armor and weapons, and he's ready to fight Palamon. And so the two of them prepare to fight to the death over Amelia, who still doesn't know they exist, other than that Amelia knows who Arcate is, but doesn't know his true identity. And there's this moment before they fight where they again show each other affection. They do care about each other, but they also are not willing to let this go. But just as the two of them begin to fight, they hear horns in the distance as Theseus and his hunting party are coming nearby. Arcate wants to call a halt to it, but Palamon won't, and so they're still in the middle of their fight when Theseus arrives. Theseus halts them, seeing that they are basically illegally dueling, and then Palamon announces both of their identities. He as the escaped prisoner, and Arcate as the exile who has come back upon pain of death. And so he says, go ahead and kill us both, I guess. We're both fighting over Amelia. They both kind of argue over who should die first. And Theseus is like, okay, cool, I'll kill you both. But Hippolyta nudges Amelia and says, don't let them do this. You, you can stand up and speak up for them. Try to get them not killed. They're noble young men. And so Amelia stands up to Theseus and says, please don't kill them. But Theseus presents the problem. If I let them go, they'll just fight to the death anyway. If I exile them, they'll fight to the death. I can kill one of them or I can make them go opposite directions and make them swear upon their honor never to come in contact with each other again. But both of them are like, no, I won't do it. I won't swear it. I gotta kill him. I'd rather just die. And Theseus is finally like, well, Amelia, if you, if you are willing to marry one of them, then we could let one of them live at least. And this is heartbreaking for Amelia because she wants so desperately and she's trying to find a solution and she's arguing back and forth with Theseus. What is some way that I can not have these guys' blood on my head? I don't want them to die, especially die for me, and yet I never wanted to marry. Ultimately, she painfully accepts the contest that Arcate and Palamon will be allowed to go and gather some knights and they will have a competition against each other. The winner will marry Amelia, and the other will be executed. And that seems to be the only solution, much to Amelia's dismay. And so we cut to Act 4. We see the jailer, who is rather distraught at everything that's happened. His prisoner escaped, his daughter has disappeared, she's gone nuts. But he finds that Palamon confessed and asked a pardon of the jailer and the daughter. And so he's relieved about that, but he doesn't know what to do about his daughter, who is clearly broken in mind. And he and her former fiancé have a discussion about what to do about her. She's walking around talking of Palamon and singing crazy songs. And she nearly fell into the river and drowned. Again, very much a repeat of Ophelia here, whose mind is broken over what happened to her father as well as her boyfriend. 
In scene two, we find Amelia tearing herself up because she can't decide between the two of them, and she's still trying to brainstorm and think of a solution that will not end in their death. She's looking at pictures of both of them and talking about both of their qualities, and ultimately the scale is perfectly balanced in her mind. This is contrasted with Theseus and Pirithous, who are talking about the knights coming into town and how he's eager to see this contest, and they both seem very excited about it. Well, Amelia is being torn apart internally about all this. In scene three, a doctor attempts to help the jailer's daughter by asking the wooer, her fiancé, to pretend to be Palamon and woo her in the name of Palamon, hoping that ultimately, as she pours out her affection on her fiancé, she will be restored to her senses. Act five, scene one, is one of the key parts of both the original story as well as the play. It's the pre-tournament. In the pre-tournament, there are three temples, one to Mars, one to Venus, and one to Diana. And each of the three main characters go pray in a different temple. And ultimately, this leads to a riddle that is resolved in an interesting way. Arcate goes to the Temple of Mars and prays that Mars will help him win the battle, win the competition against Palamon. And so he seeks victory. Palamon, on the other hand, goes to the Temple of Venus and asks that she will grant him Emilia. And Emilia goes to the Temple of Diana and says, I would rather not have either of these guys. I would rather have a peaceful solution to all of this. But if I can't have that, at least let the one who loves me the most have me. And all three of the gods appear to give a sign. So how is Arcate going to win, Palamon get Amelia, and Amelia get the guy who loves her most? The poem deals a whole lot more with the discussion in heaven over all of this, but the play just cuts straight to the solution. In scene two, we see the jailer's daughter's fiancé wooing the jailer's daughter as Palamon, with the doctor kind of nudging him and giving him advice. She accepts him, but I think the most notable thing is the last thing she says is that she hopes he doesn't hurt her. If he does, then she'll cry. In scene three, Amelia refuses to watch the contest. She can't bear it. And so she stays outside and frets about which one should win. And she hears little updates of moments when Arcate is in the lead and Palamon is in the lead. And it's the intense anticipation. It ultimately ends as Arcate has the victory and Palamon has lost. And now, Palamon will have to be executed. And Arcate comes in with Theseus, and he greets Amelia as his new wife. But both Arcate and Amelia realize what they've lost in this moment, that Palamon's execution is going to be painful for both of them. Amelia because she feels responsible, and Arcate because this is his kinsman who he deeply loved. He says, Emily, to buy you I have lost what's dearest to me. Save what is bought, and yet I purchase cheaply as I do rate your value. He lost the thing that was most dear to him in order to get her. She says, is this winning? Oh, all you heavenly powers, where is your mercy? But that your wills have said it must be so, and charge me live to comfort this unfriended, this miserable prince that cuts away a life more worthy from him than all women. I should and would die too. In scene four, we see Palamon being led to execution. And so the jailer leads Palamon to execution, and he asks about her daughter, finding that she has been restored and is happy. And just as Palamon lays his head on the block to be beheaded, in runs Pirithous to tell him that everything has changed. Arcate was riding his horse in victory when the horse suddenly reared and fell, and the saddle horn smashed Arcate in the chest giving him a mortal wound, and Arcate is now on his deathbed. And in comes Theseus, Hippolyta, Amelia, and Arcate carried on a stretcher. And Arcate, in his moment of death, apologizes for the fact that he claimed Amelia after Palamon had done so. And he says, you deserve her, you should have her now as I die. And so the gods arranged it all, where Arcate would get the victory in the competition, but Palamon, who did a fantastic job in the, in the competition, just barely lost, and everyone honors him, deserves Amelia after all this, and he gets the girl. And Amelia gets the one that actually prayed for love rather than for victory. And so we come to the conclusion. 
is an interesting if unusual addition to Shakespeare's canon and worth looking at and comparing to the original Chaucer, as well as to plays such as Two Gentlemen of Verona, where two guys compete over a girl, but ends in a comedy. And perhaps interesting to compare the jailer's daughter to Ophelia. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or watch another video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.